from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Shanali Basak and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, Powell signals the Fed to stay on hold, but leaves a future rate hike on the table. Now investors are on edge as yields remain at cycle highs. And credit concerns grow with a fast-growing wall of maturities. And that's around the corner, but first we begin with a big issue, volatility around Powell. Well, the Fed, I think, is trying to do is buy time. Powell said in his remarks is, you know, the Fed takes the world as it is. The committee is really feeling its way to what is the right level of real interest rates. It's actually a pretty a pretty optimistic speech about yeah. how the economy is performing. Not going to take another hike off the table. We're going back to 2%. Like the Fed, the Fed is absolutely capable of getting us there. The focus on how long the Fed has to stay on hold. Look, I think the Fed keeps rate higher for longer until they get a recession. Yeah, I think the Fed's on hold until they see whether the economy slows as much as they anticipate. Powell himself said he expects growth to be below trend. If you see inflation sort of stagnate, stay at current levels, then the committee will conclude that they have to raise rates a bit. The market's done some work for the Fed, but are we restrictive enough? This restrictive policy is not yet showing up in the economic data. Even if they are on hold in, on November 1st at the meeting, high for long will still be an important part of the narrative. Now, volatility is alive and well as we inch higher on the 10-year. And there is this worry about what 5% means for the 10-year yield. Now, that drive to 5, as All Springs George Borey calls it. Now, Ed Yardani says 5% is that level where you start to worry more meaningfully about a deeper recession. Now, markets have been whipsawing and, frankly, many investors wrong in the past two years about whether we would hit this mark and whether it was sufficient for returns. We'll keep an eye on that level, especially because now 20 basis point moves in just a couple of days is part of the, for the course when you're looking at the move in the 10-year yield. Now let's flip up the board here and like talk about the long term here because the two-year versus the 30-year curve is pretty dramatically changing very quickly here. We're looking at the longest inversion in decades that is now flipping positive. And while on the face of it that could look like a good thing, you have real worries underpinning the market here about what this means for the long end of the curve. That steep, steep sell off in 10-year and 30-year maturities, you have a question of whether this means that there's more trouble ahead for the U.S. economy as we look at what they call a bear steepening. Now, to talk about this more is Carissa McDonough of Community Bank and All Springs, George Borey. When we think about these moves that we're seeing here, Carissa, what does 5% in particular on the 10-year mean to you? Uh, at this point, I think that that is kind of our new level set. A kind of higher rates have lost their shock value. I think what the market is trying to digest here is that we are in a new kind of natural rate environment. The neutral rate is going to be 5% or somewhere around there, and, and the market is just trying to digest that at this point. It's not, there's no shock and awe involved anymore. Now, Bloomberg caught up with Fed Chair Powell earlier this week, headlining a week of Fed speak. He weighed in on where interest rates are heading. Take a listen. Where will rates settle out? What will be at the, a normal rate? So if, if, the, if a typical Fed tightening cycle would leave you at 5 or 6%, and, and this is, this is in the, before the pandemic and before this, the low inflation period, you would have had, had uh, Fed rates in 4 or 5% or even higher frequently. Are we going back to that? I really don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. I mean, my guess is it'll be somewhere in the middle. Now, what I was hearing there was 5% or even higher. George, what are the potential here that higher is the new reality than 5%? Yeah, I think, as I mentioned before and earlier, um, you know, the drive to five is well underway and, and effectively accomplished. Um, and, you know, what Powell is saying is that, you know, if necessary, they would certainly take yields higher. That's been a that's been a very consistent message since the last rate hike back in back in July. So they've been on hold for a while, but they need to continue to emphasize to the market that they will act if necessary. And so they're waiting for if necessary. Now, behind that is a major renormalization of yields. And as the Fed has raised rates and has sort of pulled its way out of the market on, in, for, in the form of, of, of quantitative tightening, the, the private market is left to basically determine 
you know, the right level of yields. We've gone through a major recalibration. And so we look at the yield curve, it's pretty flat. That's telling you that we're at a level of yields that the market's now increasingly comfortable with is willing to kind of wait and hold and kind of carry that into the future. Well, what's the shock here? What is the risk here that things start to move higher from here, given that the markets have been so misplaced for the last couple of years yeah. on even 5% alone? We have to watch forward-looking inflation expectations. They remain fairly well anchored. As long as they remain anchored, we can go through this sort of cyclical wave of volatility, this normalization of yields. And then we'll see how the economy unfolds. The shock value would be an acceleration of inflation, and then the Fed loses control of those forward-looking inflation expectations. That's not in the market yet. If that were to occur, to occur, that would be the shock value. Now, this is the short term. Carissa, let's talk about the long term. Let's try to explain the impossible here. What is driving that sell-off in the long end of the curve? Well, there's a couple of things going on, and there are a lot of theories. But uh, as I referred to at the outset, I think the, the market is trying to reprice what is the long-term neutral rate. And I think that the commentary around um, kind of a reset across markets is what's happening. We, when it's uh, it, during the pandemic or even during the, the teens, uh, the 20 teens, when we had very low rates for an extended period, uh, there were a lot of kind of economic drivers behind that. And we're coming out of that cycle into a new economic cycle with changes in demographics and changes in the global economy, which could drive those rates higher. I think there's something more that we need to keep in mind, which is uh, the Treasury market is starting to price in these higher neutral rates. We haven't seen that flow through the other markets yet. You know, I haven't seen credit repriced to the extent I would have expected. You know, junk bonds, if we're talking about a recessionary period, we should really expect to see uh, spreads in the in the thousands, and we're nowhere near that. So what that tells me is during a really speedy Fed hiking cycle, we have not yet seen that impact flow through the entire economy. Treasury is getting it right first, but we're going to see that over time. George, speak to the long end of the curve here. What kind of propensity do you have to take on duration risk, given the volatility that's frankly steeper yeah. when you look at 10 or even 30 years out? Right, right. Well, uh, Carissa mentioned many big long-term factors that help to drive kind of expectations around the long end. There are also some very meaningful technical variables. You know, as we know, uh, the Treasury has a long and, and uh, steep um, sort of issuance pattern that they need to kind of climb over over the next several months into next year and well beyond. Now, the, on the opposite side of that, there are a limited number of duration buyers. At a price, the Treasury, the Treasury will always find the next marginal buyer, but we're kind of moving away from that structural demand that was led by the Fed to private sector demand, which is going to be much, much more price sensitive. So can yields go higher? They can, but they're going to be economically dependent and technically dependent. And right now, the technicals don't look so great. It's the volume of bonds that are coming into the market at a time where the market's kind of saturated, a little bit worried about inflation, and then there's sort of all these big macro factors unknown. Go ahead. So if this kind of bear steepening here is happening because of technical reasons, Carissa, weigh in here too, because is that meaning that there could be worse news for the economy ahead if technicals are driving so much of the move? Yes, that's, uh, that is entirely possible. And I will just step back and say, so often um, hard landings start out looking like soft landings. And like I said, I think kind of the repricing in the long end for the all the variety of reasons that we've talked about, um, I think that that's the bond market pricing and the idea that uh, the whole economy is going to have to price off these higher rates and that's going to flow through. Uh, you know, home sales, commercial real estate, uh, credit. So I think there is some concern. Um, you know, bear steepening is a, is a very um, kind of unique and rare situation. You don't often see it. It's usually bull steepening. The Fed is uh, jumping in to start cutting rates when you have a, a yield curve inversion. So this is a unique set of affairs, and you know, it, it presents opportunities. 
But uh, I, again, we need to be very cognizant of what that's telling investors at this point. Now, George, I want to read you something that caught my eye on social media earlier this week. That is Andromeda's Alberto Gallo, who posted on X after he saw Powell's comments on the current state of the U.S. fiscal picture. He said it's been unusual for the Fed to make direct remarks on fiscal policy. But in today's question and answer, the Fed chair let something slip. The bond vigilantes are taking note. You saw that long end really start to decouple yesterday as Fed Chair Powell was speaking. What did you make of those remarks? Well, I think it's a recognition that monetary policy can focus on the economy, can focus on inflation, can focus on some of the technical factors, but then there's a fiscal story behind us. And if the Fed has to sort of at least acknowledge the potential fiscal pressures that are coming, you know, sort of down the pipe because we're funding wars, we're funding sort of social programs, we're funding um, tech and strategic investments, you know, the long end's going to pick up on that. And if, if the Fed isn't going to be the backstop buyer, then the private sector needs to be that buyer. And they're going to ask for a little bit of an extra premium because of the uncertainty. And to Carissa's point, does that mean what looks like a soft landing could be an even harder landing yeah. because of these dynamics? Th I think that's that's a really good point. And, and as Carissa said, you know, the likelihood of a hard landing goes up. But we want to be very clear. We are in a soft landing. This whole discussion of are we going to be in a soft landing doesn't make sense to us. We are in a soft landing. The question is, how long is it going to last and what's on the other side of this? And the reality is, is the, the market doesn't know either. When a yield curve flattens out like we've seen today, yes, it will create some sort of forward pressure because of the higher yield and the higher cost of capital. But what the market's telling us is the market doesn't know which way we're going to break either, that we could continue along this path of ongoing softish landing, or we could roll over because of the big lagged effects in monetary policy that maybe just haven't kind of really, really bitten mm -hmm. hard yet. So there's still more to come. Carissa, with 5% uh, 10 year yields, what else breaks? Uh, what else breaks? Well, like I said, I think we're going to start to see uh, housing market. I have more issues. You've started to see, you know, 8% mortgage rates, um, housing um, sales are dropping. Uh, I think once you start to have companies need to refinance or you have adjustable rate loans, um, any of that type of thing, that's going to be present a problem as well. Um, like I said at the outset, um, this has been such a rapid tightening cycle, one of the fastest in history. Mm -hmm. We really haven't allowed the effects to kind of ripple through the economy. So um, as George was saying, right. market never knows if when it, the yield curve is flat, you're not sure which way it's going to go. But I don't think there are very many instances in the, in market history where we've had a mm -hmm. spree steepening to a normal yield curve after we've had the massive inversion that we had over the last year and a half. George Borea and Carissa McDonough, we thank you so much for your time. Up next, the auction block, where the U.S. banks hit the market as the group likely expects it to be more expensive to borrow in the future. This is Real Yields on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block, where after earnings reports, the U.S. banks stole the issuance spotlight. We'll start with the regional banks, PNC, BNY Mellon, U.S. Bank Corp with issuance. PNC leading the way with $3.5 billion in an offering. While the big banks were expected to stay on the sidelines, but instead flooded the market with new deals, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Goldman Sachs all had sales. And over in high yield, the deep freeze for issuance remains with just one sale this week. October seeing a big drop off with only about $6.7 billion in sales so far. Higher yields and the potential for a rise in defaults was on top of mind for Apollo's Torsten Slock when we caught up with him earlier this week. We are already seeing, in particular on the consumer side, a rise in delinquency rates, as you're highlighting, looking also at default rates for high yield also going up. And likewise, bank lending is also slowing down in the weekly data. So the textbook would predict that the economy would begin to slow down by reacting with more people falling behind on payments on the consumer side, more corporates going bankrupt, and banks slowing down lending. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the data. 
Joining us now, Mike Contopoulos of RB Advisors and Will Smith of Alliance Bernstein. Mike, if you take a look at spreads, you think that nothing is wrong in the market almost. But then you look at bankruptcies and you realize that perhaps things are starting to crack. At what point do spreads start to widen out more meaningfully, particularly in riskier types of debt? Yeah, uh, you would think they would have already uh, widened out. Obviously, they haven't too much, although they've, they've started to. Um, if you look at IG and high yield spreads are just now finally widening, given the volatility on the rate side. Um, but there's certainly a lot more to go. You know, I, I think that you hear a lot about the maturity wall that's upcoming in high yield. Um, I tend to discount maturity walls, but this time it could be important. I think as you start getting some refinancing and some higher rates, um, that's going to cause some problems in high yield. Uh, we are seeing bankruptcies accelerate. I mean, I think through the first nine months of this year, you've had more bankruptcies in the U.S. Uh, than any time since since 2010. So it's only a matter of time. I kind of call it a, it's a little bit of a slow moving credit crunch, but um, you know, it's it's bound to happen if rates stay this elevated. Unless, of course, earnings growth makes up for it, which, you know, although we think earnings growth is going to accelerate, it's going to be hard to accelerate enough to make up for these interest payments. Now, Will, how do you look at the maturity walls that are coming up? Because the reality of the situation is that's when you really start to feel the pain of higher interest rates and the refinancing. Yeah, Chanel, it's really just another hill for us to climb in high yield. And, and, and what, we've, what we've highlighted is that there are just several risk factors that are building um, higher rates is certainly a big element of it, and, and that's immediately felt in the leveraged loan space. That's all floating rate debt. But in the bond space, um, companies have some time to get ahead of it. And, and really what we're seeing are, are the, the better managed companies are able to delever today so that they can refinance at higher rates but have less debt and, and therefore kind of protect their cash flow. Um, but there are a lot of other factors, and the big one to us is, is where is the economy heading over the next six to 12 months? I mean, in our view, you're really going to start to feel the impact of this fiscal tightening or this monetary tightening, and that's going to cause growth to slow. And so if you're squeezed on both sides with higher rates and, 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 and higher borrowing costs and a top-line revenue that's shrinking, that's a, that's a tough combination. But just moving back to the spread argument, because I do think it's really important, um, spreads this cycle could end up looking a lot tighter than investors might think, and that's because all-in yields are so high. Um, when you look at high yield as an asset class, if you get paid 9 or 10%, which is where we are today, um, that more than compensates you for a pretty bad default environment. Now, a lot of that's coming from the Treasury side this cycle and, and not so much from the spread side of things, but investors tend to look at it as, how much money am I getting paid to own this asset class? And if I get paid nine and a half and I can wake up in five years and, and make high single digits, maybe even 10% type returns, that's a pretty good investment for me to make. Well, what's interesting about yeah, that Shanali, too- Yeah, if I can, if yeah, I can just jump ahead, in Mike, there really please. quickly. Yeah. I want, you know, be before the show, I, I reached out to Will. I was like, what can we argue about? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I agree with him 100%. Um, you know, myself and, and Rich Bernstein were talking about this a few weeks ago. You know, prior to 2000 and, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, high yield was not a spread product, right? It was a yield product. It's only when rates went very, very low did it become a spread product because you couldn't get any yield. So then all everybody cared about was, was spread. And so I, I tend to agree with Will. And the other thing that high yield has going for it versus, say, private credit or leveraged loans, which are floating rate, is it's just a higher quality market than it has been because a lot of the junkiest junk have gone to private credit, have gone to the leveraged loan market. And so I'd actually think there's going to be more stress there than in traditional high yield. Well, that's pretty hilarious because they think that they're coming in to save the day. But at the same time here, both of you are also saying things could get worse out there. And if that's the case and you can see fallen angels start to add up, why get into high yield with the loss uh, potential ahead of you? And, you know, Mike, I'll let you take that one because you made the pitch for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I don't think now is necessarily the time to be adding high yield because of all the things we've mentioned earlier, right? The, the interest cost, the refinance risk, et cetera. Um, you have to, I, for, from our perspective, you have to wait to see how this cycle plays out. I mean, our earnings models are actually quite positive at the moment. So that's where one, you know, one area maybe Will and I disagree. We look at earnings growth as being quite strong over the next several quarters. The problem is liquidity is very tight. Uh, and rates are very high. So how do you kind of square that circle where you have, you know, reasonable earnings growth, but uh, but tight liquidity? 
And I think we're in sort of a wait and see approach, quite frankly. And the nice thing about the market today, the fixed income market today, is you don't have to own high yield or you don't have to own investment grade credit if you're a multi asset manager. There are other options out there, whether it be something like AAA CLOs, whether it be you know, front end treasuries or preferreds. There's sort of other areas to get uh, reasonable yield uh, at a pretty attractive risk profile. And so I don't think now is the time, but you know, maybe in, in six months, if you get some spread widening here, it may be. Yeah, I agree. What's the entry point here, Will, in terms of uh, what the entry point would be when you look at spreads? Well, Shai, I mean, I, I think when we think about high yield in general, what we urge investors to do is to think about the overall asset allocation. And Mike was mentioning this. There are some other things that you can do that might look a little bit more attractive than traditional high yield. But if you if you expand the horizon and look at, say, equities, I mean, this environment arguably is a little bit more challenging for equities than it is for credit. I mean, at least in credit, you're getting paid all of that additional uh, rate pressure that the Fed has put into the market, you're getting paid that as an investor. As an equity investor, you're paying that away to debt investors. Um, so we think that's it's arguably a better dynamic to be in the credit side of things, even if you think spreads are a little bit tight, because the cash flow dynamics are so much better. Um, in terms of an entry point, I mean, we, we focus on two things. All in yields around 10% are really attractive. We're probably about 50 basis points away from that. Um, if you look on, on a spread basis, we think once you hit about five to five hundred or five hundred to five fifty in spreads, this cycle is going to look pretty attractive, especially if rates are still pretty high. Um, because if, historically, if you're a buyer of high yield at eleven or twelve percent yields, um, it's pretty tough to lose money. And and to go back on a, a point that Mike made earlier, it's not the same high yield market as it has been historically. So investors who are looking at high yield and say, well, when a recession hits, it goes to a thousand. Like it's a very different market today. Um, just to give you one data point, we have roughly half the amount of triple C rated debt today than we did in 07. So if you're waiting for like the 08 scenario mm -hmm. where you have right. massive defaults and, and huge spread widening, it's just a very different market today. So we think investors should, should think about it in a different lens. Mike Antopoulos and Will Smith, we thank you so much for your time. Now still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead. Big tech earnings plus important inflation data coming up. This is Real Yields on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basic, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread the week ahead. Big tech earnings, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, and the ECB and Fred's preferred gauge of inflation throughout all of next week. But we do have to talk a little bit about that PCE before I let you go, because since it is a preferred gauge, it is expected to decline. But a lot of uncertainty ahead. Does it from New York, same time, same place next week. This is Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg.